good evening. Um, happy to have uh, a guest who I will call Lynn. And I am departing from our kind of normal guests who have been mostly homeschooling moms and um, home educating parents in the mentoring and interest-based method to talk to um, Lynn, who has been a public school teacher for about eight years. Um, she has taught mostly in the middle school ages, um, English as a second language, and found this year that she needed to take a break because of the kinds of things that were coming down the pike. And I'm just going to let her tell her story. And I want to just say that it's amazing to me that um, I found somebody to come forward. People that I've talked to in the system, the public school system, are deathly afraid of losing their jobs or not having their contracts renewed or becoming targets for haters and all kinds of things um, because they don't agree with what they have to, to do to be a public school teacher. And it's amazing, um, Lynn, not her real name, has come forward. She doesn't wanna show her face. She doesn't feel like she can. It's crazy and outrageous that a person cannot speak their mind these days. They have to hide in the shadows to do this. Um, it should be infuriating to all of us. So I will turn it over to Lynn and just let her tell you her story. Hello. Okay, so I just finished up about eight years of teaching. I started with seventh and eighth grade math. I did that for about four-ish years. Um, I had about 30 kids in each class. And then I got switched over to English as a second language, which is kids coming in from all kinds of countries. Um, and it would range from kids who had been, their parents paid for them to go to private schools in these countries who were above level to kids living in the jungle, sleeping on the ground who had no education at all. And those classes would be between five and 10 kids. So I've kind of had a wide variety of educational experiences. But um, here recently, I felt like I needed a break because of the different agendas that we were started having to start to push. And a lot of this was coming down from the state. It wasn't just per school. And some of the big agendas that was strongly pushed the last couple of years was the white privilege issues, which I felt wasn't that our management wasn't trained on properly to be training us on. And it was fine for them to be teaching us about it. But when it started to be, OK, we're now going to push this on the kids and teach the kids about this, I got really upset because I feel like students should be able to go to school and learn math and history and, you know, reading and writing and, you know, maybe have electives like music and sports and not have to be worrying about these agendas that they're going to have to deal with as adults later. So that was a big one. And the other big one is, and I, let me just preface this by saying, I, I have no, um, preference yeah yes against any sexual orientation or any of that like you do what you want to do that's fine but I don't feel like there should be um sexual oriented clubs in a middle school setting because we shouldn't as a school be teaching students to be sexually active and there's even laws that if we find out a student is sexually active we are supposed to report it to to different social services to get the kid removed because there's usually reasons they're experimenting this young. And so, so what, have, do you, what do you mean by removed? Um, get them removed. Well, like, mean, go ahead. What do you mean that you mean removed from the school? No, um, the way our state is set up, if, if a student that's underage in the middle school age is sexually active or participating in sexual acts, 
the social services like CPS, child social services would come in and investigate what's going on with their parents. I mean, their, their parents could get in big trouble just for them being sexually active, even if their parents had nothing to do with it, you know, which I mean, kids are going to make mistakes and participate in things when, you know, they're not supervised, but sure. there's now laws to try and protect kids from that situation. Mm, so interesting to have clubs that in my opinion only focus on their what they prefer sexually shouldn't be allowed in middle schools and then you know we were never explained to whether the parents had any knowledge of these clubs if there was parent permission slips to allow students to participate in these clubs I just don't think it was very thought out for a middle school setting but that's my personal <clears throat> do you know how these clubs got started? I do not. And anytime we would ask deeper questions, we would kind of get sidestepped away from, you know, the question. Which means it, it wasn't probably grassroots. Probably not. I'm sure, you know, a couple students got together and said, hey, we wanted to start these clubs. And, you know, someone didn't thoroughly think it through and was like, oh, okay, it's, you know, a place where y'all can relate to each other and just went on about it. Mm hmm. Um, let, let me back up a minute about the white privilege um, critical race theory training. And I just want to ask you a personal question. Are, do you do you agree with that? Not agree. And I'm not I'm not judging at all anybody with that. But I, I just want to know <clears throat> what, what your orientation is to that simply because to show people that you're just you're just like half half the country's for it. Half the country isn't right. Right. So do you I mean. Do you feel it's appropriate to be teaching that in the public system or not appropriate? Well, I don't, uh, I don't follow it because I try to avoid politics because of the angst of it. But the way it was presented and taught to us was a very negative experience because they had us take a test to see how we viewed white privilege as if um, if we were prejudiced, basically. Like it was wow. literally a multiple choice test and based on your score, told you basically how racist you were. Wow. Other yes, it was, it was oh the gosh. most awful training. I went home and bawled because I'm like, that's not my job. That's not what I'm here for. Yeah. And do you remember what kind of questions they asked you? Uh, it was just different scenarios about how you would react to different people, whether, you know, if you would react a certain way based on their race or their status, just different things like that. If it was just awful, I, I oh my gosh. got rid of it. It was so awful. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, and um. basically the whole training was, um, you know, persecuting you if you were white, like if you were white, you were trying to crawl under the table. Cause I mean, it was like, you were the worst person ever based on how they were training us about it. You know, they were basically like, you're the problem. Um, uh, you know, you're the most racist person ever just because of the color of my skin. Well, wow. from my perspective, I didn't choose what I was when I was born, you know? Right. And I grew up in a very low income community, right along with the kids I was teaching. I grew up in that neighborhood because I, I taught at a low income school. And uh, so to me, that was wrong of them to say that I'm bet I, I was better off just because of my skin, whereas my parents had to work just as hard as those kids. It's just my parents made the choices, you know, that they made to get us out of there and do what they had to do. Mm -hmm. you know, my parents didn't have any better jobs than the kids I was teaching. So, wow. I, it was, it was just a very negative experience. And then we were forced to read these books that we didn't get to pick the books we read to gain knowledge in these perspectives. They picked the, the types of books they wanted and made us read them. Do you remember what, what any of those were? Uh, Not off the top of my head. <laughs> okay. No, that's okay. I can look them up and share them with you later, though. Okay. 
I, but, not that I want to read them, but, no, but no, just curious books. for reference sake. I mean, they, they weren't, they didn't cover the whole topic of the white pri- privilege critical race theory. It was, it was one portion of it. And what me and another friend that I worked with got upset about was we are both visually impaired and have low vision and disabilities. And part of this whole thing should be, you know, not only based on race, it should be based on sexual orientation, race, disabilities, all the things that are persecuted, basically. Yeah. I mean, if you are, if you are, um, if you are trying to teach sensitivity, Mm -hmm. that you, you can totally go along with that because of, I mean, theoretically, because of how acrimonious, you know, our country is right now how mm-hmm. much division there is. If you're trying to go into the schools and, and say to the teachers, we need, we need to tamp down on this. We need to teach kids to be accepting and tolerant and loving. Mm-hmm. You know what? I, I could, I could sign up for that. But when you're telling one race, we're having all these problems and you're, you're the one doing it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> when you're not the one doing it, And it's, and you can't help it because you're a white person. That's just crazy. That, that Mm -hmm. is not going to heal any, that's not going to heal anything. That's not going to cause people to come together. That's not going to increase love or sensitivity or tolerance. Nothing. Nothing's going to come of that, but more hatred. Period. End of story. And it, it created a divide within the staff, you know, because I mean, we feel like we've just been beaten for an hour and the other, and a lot of the other races did stand up and say, no, it's not their fault. I'm not a victim. I'm not letting you, you know, making me feel this way. And they, they stood up and, you know, stated their opinions as well. I mean, none of them was like, yeah, it's your fault. They did that, but it, it did create a weird, like, I'm going to stay away from you because you probably feel this way because you're not the right. same race as me. And, 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 and as adults, as, a, as professional adults, professional mm-hmm. educators with college educations, you, if you're feeling that, if you can't get over that funky feeling <laughs> and that mm-hmm. those funky vibes, what are young kids who have no experience in the world and, and cannot really critically think at this age? Come, mm-hmm. I mean, let's be honest. Yes. What in the world is supposed, do they think is supposed to come of that? I'm not sure because at a middle school age just from experience kids are so easy to jump on one side or the other of things especially based on what they have at home of course and you see it every year with the election I mean you we had kids crying to us that they were going to be deported based on if Trump won right and we're like that's not how this works you're okay but just because their own misunderstandings you know yeah. There's already a divide and a, and a weirdness. Yeah. So that's part well, of the reason I'm like, I need a break from this. <laughs> I, I'm, I don't feel comfortable teaching a 13 year old about white privilege. Yeah. You know, when they're not going to understand it in the first place. Right. So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about my history with this. Um, we visited a little bit about this, but I didn't, I didn't tell you this. Um, one of the reasons that I pulled my kids 25 years ago, uh, was because we were living in a small town in Northern California and my son was going into eighth grade and I was sitting on the school site council of his junior high. He was going into eighth grade in the next year. And in the spring of his seventh grade year, one of the last uh, school site council meetings we had was about a curriculum that the school district had um, written with the help of the indigenous tribe there, the the, uh, Native American tribe that lived in the area. They had gotten a grant from the federal government to write this this curriculum. And it was gonna be the eighth grade social studies, of course. And it was all on researching um, newspaper articles that of course they would, it wasn't really research, it was, stuff that they provided the kids to read letters and newspaper articles and different, um, you know, sources of information that spoke disparagingly about that tribe there in the area, because 150 years ago, 
when the settlers came in for the logging and the fishing in particular and the trapping, um, they went to war with that tribe and, and they, um, you know, drove them out and drove them into the mountains. Mm. Ter terrible thing that happened. It was not okay, but they were, it was the wild west. <laughs> it happened, you know, mm. and the, the white kids were going to be reading all this stuff and then they were going to have to write multiple apology letters to the other native American kids or any, any kids of color in, in that room. They oh, were wow. going to have to apologize for what their white ancestors, it only there wasn't their white ancestors. It, it had nothing to do with any of those kids, uh, any of those mm -hmm. white kids in the room. And I had grown up, I spent two years in a native American village in Alaska in my high school years and I understood their story and I knew it was just basically the same thing. You know, it was when the white people came in for the fishing and, and timber, they had problems, you know, with the Navy. I mean, they, they, you know, had, gen there was a genocide. And so, you know, I had to over, I was the only white girl in the school and I had to overcome a, ma a massive amount of prejudice. And I raised my hand in this, the school site council. I said, this is not what's going to bring people together. This is not what's going to help people understand history and not repeat it. This is not what's going to heal the your these Native American kids. Mm. What's going to do it is is let's have a festival. Let let us, invite us to your festivals. Invite us to <laughs> learn about your culture. Invite us to participate in your culture. Let's do activities that make us bond. You know, mm -hmm. and I was totally shot down, and at, that was at that point I thought I can't subject my son to this. I I, I'm just not going to, <laughs> I just can't do, that was one of the reasons he was also struggling in school, but I just, it's just, it, this has been going on for at least 25 years. Yes. The, the federal government has been pushing this kind of thing for many, many years, a couple of decades. And people haven't realized it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's and, definitely more about the agenda and it, and it stems from the state because you, you have federal laws and state laws that mandate what we teach as far as they give you a list of what we call teaks or standards. And it's, it's a detailed sentence for each kind of topic, but yet it's still so broad that there's no way to get this list done in a year mm -hmm. and then make laws of now we have laws if a student is considered homeless, which is if they don't live with both parents or if they live with grandparents or if they've moved so many considered times. Considered homeless if they live? Yes. Homeless? Yes. yes. That's so crazy. This affects the discipline system because if they're considered homeless, they're, you're not allowed to expel them. So if they've done an offense that should be expelled by punishment, they, you don't get to do it. So anybody that's not living with both parents is considered homeless. They designate them as homeless. Yeah. Like if they live with grandparents they, or they live with one parent. Yes. yes. Wow. Which is like, and that's not, that's 70. not word, word, but. Is there any way for you to get me those? I would love to see those. Um, teaks. Did you call them? Mm -hmm. Yes. It's, uh, you, yes, I'll get you the website for them. Okay. Wow. So that just makes it impossible to have any kind of discipline then yeah. in, in the schools, because most kids are in that situation at this point, mm -hmm. especially in a low income yes. school. So, you know, I mean, if you have a repeat offender, I mean, Nature is based on cause and effect. You know, if you do this, <laughs> right. this is your consequence. I right. mean, whether it's a good consequence or a bad consequence, it's just, it's nature. So, I mean, if you're repeat behaving a certain way and you're not, you Never know, having getting, consequence, you're yeah. not learning a lot. So <laughs> do you, what, where do you, where do you think this comes from? Why, why is this? Is this coming well, from the state or is this coming from the federal? Well, if you kind of look at it, I mean, like SWATs and things have been taken out of most state schools. What are SWATs? 
like spankings in school. Oh, swatting. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So probably, I mean, I only have experience from my state, but probably on a federal level. Uh, I would those those teaks are coming from a federal a mandate. Oh, the teaks, the teaks, no. I mean, each state has its own version of standards that they require. Okay. Um, a lot of the United States does the common core standards. Yeah. So you you come from a very uh, conservative state, and that's all that I'll say. I don't want to name the state that you're in. Okay. Um, and we'll just leave it at that. So the, those TEAK standards you're saying come from this at the state level. And being in a very conservative state, that is even super concerning that you would mm-hmm. have you would have and a low income um, school that you would not have a firmer set of standards for behavior. Mm -hmm. Well, and uh, the standards I was referring to was just the, what we teach. It's not necessarily the discipline, but there's been so many laws based on what you're allowed to do. Like a long time ago, you know, if a, if like a football student wasn't behaving in class and was causing di- disruptions, the coach was allowed to have them do extra laps or extra push-ups or whatever, but that's yeah. not even a anymore. Yeah. You know, and most people would just consider that a general punishment for misbehaving, you know? Yeah. And. But what can they do? Do they do, do they do uh, uh, detention or what do they do? What's the, you know, they just talk to them. They Notify start with them and you know calling the parents and 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 that works with some students but not everybody especially when you're in a low income side of town where kids have parents that are missing and not part of the picture anyway mm-hmm. uh, the tensions are still allowed um but basically all the discipline where a school is allowed to do is they work up what they call a matrix which would start with you got in trouble you got a referral you get talked to and then if you did it again you get detention and then if you do it again and depending on the severity of what you did you get what they call in school suspension where you're taken out of classes and put in a room with other students who are in school suspended Mm -hmm. so you know the idea is you're missing instruction. You're going to fall behind. You're hurting yourself. But a lot of the times kids don't view it that way. They view it as a party time. You know, I got out of class. Sure. Sure. They don't want to be there in the first place for a lot of them. Right. I mean, they wouldn't be acting like that if they did. Yep. And then the next one is out of school suspension, which is also limited by if you fall under the homeless and different things. Um, And then, the next severe is a different school placement where you have to go to this other school for so many days. And it's, it's supposed to be more strict and locked down, but most of the kids that come back, they're like, I want to be over there. It was better over there. <laughs> and it could be because they get to work at their own pace there, but I don't know, but well, that, that's basically the discipline. Yeah. She's ridiculous. And you wonder if this is, if they're, if they're making these designations, if they're making these definitions of, Mm -hmm. you know, what a student's home life is like, and they're using these statistically for things, you know, and, and it also makes you wonder if the reason that they're doing this is because they get federal money for having the student, you know, I I just, I have to understand, I would, I need to understand in my head why they would break down the discipline. So, you know, obviously, <laughs> and it must come down to money. Yes. Only thing I, can think of. I was just having a conversation with a, an assistant principal friend about this, that um, basically the way it works is you get school districts get paid per kid per day. Yeah. And now in some places it's per minute, minutes of days. Wow. Yeah. So it, interesting. And, with the whole Corona thing and people shutting down and doing distance learning, if those kids are pulled out and doing distance learning, 
the school districts aren't getting that money that they would have been getting for those kids because their mm-hmm. numbers are down. So, so yeah, it's, it's one of the roots of the problem is money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So you decided, um, to take a break. Um, Oh, my kitty, <laughs> no kitty, you can't be here. Um, what else can you, I mean, you're taking a break or you, you're trying to go back. I mean, have you just taken a leave of absence or? Uh, for now it's a leave of absence. <laughs> if some other things work out, it might be permanent, but, and I may just need to try, you know, a different district or a different, maybe private school or charter school or take a different test and be able to teach at a different level. And yeah. And maybe I can find happiness in there somewhere. But, <laughs> but the pressure, gonna, the, pre- yeah. the, the pressure is immense, isn't it? It is. It just, I mean, from, it all kind of started with the pacing when I was in mainstream classes. I mean, you have 30 kids that you have a list of things you have to get done and you kind of have to zero in on, you know, what's the test going to ask them for, you know, a state test. What's, what do they need for the next grade level? But Mm -hmm. kids don't all learn on the same level or the same pace. Right. That was my first upset with being in public schools because you know, if you need this basic skill and you're not getting it and I'm pushing you to move on to the next skill and then making you come after school or lunch to, you know, catch up on what you're still not getting, they just get more and more bogged down and more and more frustrated. You know, they feel like they're being left behind. And I, I would totally get it. I felt that way as a kid myself. And so that was one of my first things. I have it all written down on this paper. Um, <laughs> And then my next thing that irritated me was we had changed standards or updated them and they had tried to get textbooks out so fast to meet the next school year with these changes that there were so many errors and just things that they, the, the methodology in the textbook would kind of contradict past textbooks. And this is math. I mean, math doesn't change that much. That it shouldn't. Fast. Yeah, it shouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this yeah. is why we have generations that do math two different ways and can argue why each other feel the other is wrong. So you're teaching common core math? Uh, no. <laughs> Thank heaven. Do what? I've, I've seen, I have seen that. I mean, again, I, I was out of, I was out of all that. So mm-hmm. when my friends started bringing yeah, my younger friends with kids in school started bringing me this common core. I was like, oh my gosh, mm-hmm. this is going to, this is going to set us back decades. Yeah. Well, and what's sad is when you see common core math as a whole, as a whole curriculum, it, it's not as bad as it appears just as one topic. I think where common core is kind of getting a bad rep is the teaching methods that are being used to teach it necessarily. That's my, my viewpoint. Well, are you, what, do you, do you feel like you were pretty well? And, and, and here's, here's what I'm basing it off of my, my kids um, went from me and I'm not a math person. My husband is, has a calculator running in his head, mm-hmm. but he wasn't around to teach them math. And we just used your basic Saxon math, which is very fundamental stuff. Mm-hmm. It's super mm-hmm. fundamental, but my kids at 15 went right up to the community college they were above grade, you know, they were in college math, even though, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you, they could have actually had one daughter who was like me start, per, you know, in a class that was not college level, but that Saxon math helped them just to, to slide right into a college level uh, curriculum. It, it taught mm-hmm. exactly things exactly the same way. There was a little bit of repeat usually, and they just sailed right on. And, you know, my kids are, are, the, the math ones are in business and accounting and stuff. So I know that what I taught, which is very fundamental is interfaces very well with a college scenario. I don't know yeah. how the common core is going to do that. I don't have a lot of experience with common core. I just, in my search 
to find good resources for what I was having to teach, uh-huh. I didn't mind it as much. It seemed better aligned with um, older techniques for what I was looking for and better fundamentals and more in depth. And right. it covered, it covered the whole topic instead of picking and choosing. It felt like, like it, okay. it felt like it was better out as far as a student needs to be able to do this exact thing. Gotcha. And they need to be able to do this exact thing, especially in the kindergarten common core things. Uh-huh. Um, but I don't know in other districts, how they're forcing their teachers to teach the common core standards. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not a good resource for the common core. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. But, but just for the standards themselves and the products, like the, the worksheet type products that were out there, I didn't mind it, Mm -hmm. but that's just for my research of it. And the way that you were going to teach it. Yes. Yes. Gotcha. Gotcha. So that's my disconnect with that one. I don't know. Right. But so the pace and the agenda or the curriculums were, were a big upset for me because um, th- you just didn't have good resources because w- it would just change so fast and there were errors in the book. And in my background, I had, I have a business degree and then I went back and got a teaching degree. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm math minded originally. And right. one of the chapters is a financial chapter and the formulas in there were wrong. <laughs> and I blew my top. Cause I'm like, no, I'm not teaching a wrong formula to kids that are going to figure out I'm teaching them the wrong for, I just can't do it. Like it just goes against my morals. <laughs> well, they tried to explain to me that they rewrote the formula and took parts out so that way they could learn it at this level. And then as they go through high school, they add those parts back in. And I'm like, but you're calling this compound interest, but that formula is not compound interest. Yeah. And yeah. they argued and argued and argued. And so then as a teacher, you have to make a choice. Are you going to teach this incorrectly and mess these kids up? Yeah. Or are you going to skip this topic? <laughs> <laughs> wow. They, they get that's later. hard. That's, that's hard. I mean, it's, geez. Yeah. I mean, because even, even our common friend, that how we, me and you met, I even showed it to her because she has a business background. And, and she was like, no, that is not right. I was like, I know <laughs> I can't do this. <laughs> oh, man. So that was hard enough without, you know, getting into all the agendas they want you to throw on top of that, that you shouldn't be teaching, you know? Right. And I just, it just gets more and more where, especially where I was, that we would have to be the ones to, in our training as a teacher, you're supposed to be the neutral party in the room. Like you're just supposed to present the facts. You're not supposed to push a religious or sexual or political agenda. Like you keep all that outside the door. You just focus on the facts of your topic and, and you move on, Mm -hmm. you know? And even when a kid asks you a personal question, you're supposed, you know, you're just supposed to kind of step inside and not really answer the question. Yeah. That's what's professional. Yes. And ethical too. But more and more, we have people who have their own personal agenda and go against that professional ta- that professional teaching. I have a friend who just had a meeting with a principal because um, we have uh, officers that are stationed at each campus and they were out playing football with the boys during lunch or during PE or something. And the gym teacher rounded all the kids up and took them into the gym and explained to them why they should not trust officers that are there. To and apparently they went on and on about, you're not supposed to talk to officers. You're not supposed to trust them. Like this whole thing. That was a very personal thing to her apparently. And I'm like, they shouldn't have even said anything, but more what more possible you're... benefit is that of saying you, yeah. you should distrust a, a policeman? Yeah. So this kid gets home and is riding home with their dad and they're like, they pass an officer and 
he goes, Hey dad, by the way, you're not supposed to trust them. Don't believe anything they say. And the dad, of course, was like, what, where did this come from? You know? Right. So it gets, it gets frustrating because you have more and more people just speaking their mind instead of just there to teach, you know? Right. So, so the agendas and yeah. Um, I mean, you've got kids that are getting disability um, assistance that really shouldn't be in a disability class. So, you know, we're hurting our disability kids and it's just a whole thing. <laughs> yeah. So I wanted to ask you one other question about the policeman thing. Yeah. Is this, is this coming down again from the federal government, the state government, or is this just the, I mean, did your friend tell you, you know, I, I assume when you said she had a meeting with the principal that she confronted him about this because she probably has law enforcement in her family or something, I'm mm-hmm. assuming. And what was his reasoning for doing this? Um, it basically came down to it was just a personal opinion of the teacher. Wow. And they proceeded to project that onto a room full of middle school children. And these were sixth graders. So they're super susceptible to what your teacher says, you know. It's just crazy. That's I mean, crazy. Sixth graders are already having to decipher about should I follow what my parents say or should I do what these people at school are telling me to do? Right. Great point. In the past, you know, you were usually on the same page. Like you called the parent, said, you know, the student did this and the parent took care of the discipline and usually, you know, it fixed the issue. But now you have kids trying to like battle in their head. Okay. Do I listen to what my parents said? It just conflicted with what these adults here said, but I'm told to listen to them and trust them. Like, yeah. What are you supposed to, what are you supposed to do as a parent when you send your kid to school? Please, I'm sending you to school for six to seven hours a day, but please don't really believe anything you're hearing there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It just, I mean, what in the heck? Oh my gosh. Well, Lynn, I appreciate your coming forward. And I, I would invite you to um, invite any of your friends that would like to tell their story as well. I think the point of this is to get a change going in our system that we really start having um, a lot more dialogue on the, at the grassroots level between parents and teachers and administrators and trying to get the federal government and really the state governments out of our business. It really mm-hmm. should be a local effort between, you know, like it used to be, right? It really mm-hmm. should be a local effort between parents and, and, and administrators and teachers to give our kids the quality education that they need. It's really not effective to get standards and, you know, all these teaks and stuff like that from people that have no idea what's going on in your community. And that's really what I'm pushing for. And I, I really believe that the more power that you give parents, the more that they'll step up, they have problems. I understand, but most people love their children very much and they want the best for their children. And if they are given the opportunity, I believe they will step up. It's Mm -hmm. just that we've taken so much of the power away from them. Mm -hmm. So not in every case, but we just have a lot of work to do to, to make this right, you know, and we got to start somewhere. And I think a lot of it is just telling parents what's truly going on. In, in the public system. Mm. And I'm, I'm hoping, you know, put the word out to some of your friends and tell them I, you know, would, would love to talk to them and just hear their story so that parents can understand w- what's going on. And uh, mm. that's my plan with this also to give people an alternative and how they can do the best they can for their children. So anyway, I really, really appreciate it. And um if you think of anything else or want to tell me anything more, just get a hold of me. And, and if you have those, what we were talking about, the, the teaks and the other things, anything, any kind of documentation would be, would be really great too. Okay. Thanks so much. Have a great Thank evening. You. you too. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.